It's a conversation about printers, paper selection, and a review of the Canon Image ProGraph Pro 1000 on this episode of Behind the Shot. Hi, once again, welcome to Behind the Shot. I'm Steve Brazel, and this is a special episode of the show. It's a review of the Canon Image ProGraph Pro 1000 printer and a whole lot more. I've got four segments for you. Now, I understand you may not want to watch each and every segment, and that's okay. Jump to the part that you actually want. So I'm going to make it easy for you. If you're watching on video, and again, you can subscribe to the video version of Behind the Shot in your favorite podcast app, or you can subscribe on YouTube. If you subscribe to Behind the Shot on YouTube, make sure to click the bell so that you get each and every notification when we release something new. If you're listening to the audio version of the show, it makes it a little bit more difficult for me to give you the times. So what you should do is go by the website at BehindTheShot.tv, find the blog post for this show, and you'll see the times in the show notes there. So the segments that I've got, segment number one is your typical unboxing. Segments number two and three were really important to me. During the testing of this printer, I came up with a couple of questions that I needed answers to. I wanted to better understand what I'm dealing with with a printer like the Pro 1000 and how to get the most out of it. So first of all, in segment number two, I sit down with Jim Booth of Canon to discuss not only those specific features that you'll find in a printer like the Pro 1000, because let's be honest, who better to talk about a Canon printer than somebody from Canon, but we also have a general printing discussion. What are the differences you as an end user should see and or expect in your user experience using a pro level printer versus something that's more prosumer? Segment number three, I sit down with uh, Drew Hendricks, the president of Red River Paper, to have a conversation about the important role that paper plays in your satisfaction with your printer. Why you would choose one paper over another paper and the kinds of papers that are out there. Segment number four, that's my actual review. My thoughts on the Canon Image ProGraph Pro 1000 printer. Again, jump to wherever you want. You've seen the times come up on screen and I've, as I've been talking. Audio listeners, jump by the blog post, BehindTheShot.tv. With that in mind, let's get to the unboxing and I hope you enjoy the show. Let's take a look inside and see what we got. Now, I will tell you ahead of time, some of the stuff in here I've pulled out already and then I set it back down. I didn't want you to hear all the tape untaping and stuff like that. So first of all, to keep the corners of the box nice and strong and square from it being bumped uh, and keep the box with its shape, they put a couple of tubes in here. That's kind of a nice touch, I like that. Then we've got some, you know, the, the sample disclaimer packages, and then you have the getting started guide. And there's a getting started one and a getting started two. At quick glance, it appears to be getting started one is the setup of the printer. Getting started two is gonna be the software end of it that's gonna tell you exactly when to plug it into your computer based on when you've downloaded software. There's instructions for both Mac and Windows in here. Uh, also in the styrofoam, we've got the power cord over here. That always makes it a little easier to use. And what I'm gonna pull out next are the ink tanks. This is one of the big differences of this printer, the number of inks that you get. So depending on what you're printing, you're gonna get a lot more detail, a lot more color richness and color accuracy out of this printer. And the cost per print is gonna go down. And the cost per print goes down partially because of the size of these ink tanks. These are not small ink tanks. They've actually got some weight to them too. And as you'll see, there's a bunch of them in here. And again, we'll talk about how many inks this thing uses. There's four more down below so that you know. So let me set these ink tanks aside. And uh, I could probably cut this out, but I figure this is what you're going to go through. You might as well know, right? So let's take a look at under the styrofoam here. Under the styrofoam, we've got the printer itself. And just so that you can see on that camera, and then I've got another side camera here taking a tight shot. And hopefully that footage will work out right. Um, it's a little odd angle to get into, but the printer's about this big in this box. Okay. Uh, but it's got some weight to it. Over here, we've got four more ink tanks. And then we have this big metal-y looking thing. That's the print head, okay? So like always, print heads are sealed. So you got that. And then after that, you got the printer itself in here. And again, I don't think I'm going to pull it out yet. We'll look at it out of the box shortly. But here's the thing I want you to know about. First of all, they've got some disclaimer stuff on the top. 
And then like any printer that you buy nowadays, it's got the orangey looking or red looking, I'm colorblind, red orange tape all over it. Make sure you remove all of that as you're setting it up, follow the instructions to set it up. And uh, let's go ahead and pull this thing out of the box. We'll set it up, we'll do some test prints and we'll check them out. Okay, so now I've got this printer behind me unboxed and I gotta tell you when I lifted it out of the box, it was somewhat shocking how heavy it is. I mean, you see it and the number doesn't look that big until you're trying to carry it and it's kind of a kind of an odd dimension for a human being to lift up and put on a desk. It is really solidly built and it got me thinking before I get into the details of my thoughts of the Canon Image ProGraph Pro 1000 printer, I wanted to talk about a couple of things first. I want to talk about paper selection, and I'm going to do that with a guy from Red River Paper, Drew Hendricks, and that'll be coming up in the next segment because I think when you get a printer, the paper selection matters a great deal as well. And then the other thing I thought about was so many reviews, written or video, doesn't matter, audio, they go through just an amazing amount of specs. I mean, these dry numbers and specs that will put everybody to sleep. And if you're listening in the car, you're going to end up crashing. And I don't want that to happen. But I did want to kind of get into the fact that I've had a Canon uh, PIXMA Pro 100 printer sitting behind me for a number of years. And I loved it. It prints great photos. And now I've got this Image ProGraph Pro 1000 sitting here, thanks to Canon. They sent it to me to, to do a review on and I wanted to get not so much little number details, but I wanted to kind of, from a general printing point of view, have you as a viewer and a listener and a photographer and a printer understand what you should expect out of a printer of this kind of level versus the more consumer or, or prosumer level. And to do that, I realize I've got access to Canon. So I would like to welcome Jim Booth of Canon USA to uh, the show. Jim, thanks for joining me. Steve, thanks for having me. Um, I do have a question for you real quick. What's your actual title at Canon? Uh, I'm a product planning advisor. Okay, so you're right. This is right up your alley. Thanks for sending me this thing. And, and the short, too long, didn't read version so far is this thing's pretty amazingly built. I've had a number of printers. I used to have actually uh, a Canon 9000 Mark II. I had the Pro 100 that's been sitting behind me for, for years. Anybody who watches the show has seen it. And now the Pro 100, and, and I mentioned in the intro to this, this review show, I'm a firm believer in printing, right? And no matter where you print, I mean, if you want to send to a lab, send to a lab. I just think that really photos, when you hold them in your hand, there's something extremely special about it. But when you do it at home, I've been a little surprised, and we'll get into the accounting manager. That was one of my big surprises in a minute. But I've been a little bit surprised at the cost not being what I thought it would be. You and I talked about this at WPPI on the show floor because one of, I think, the big misunderstandings is, oh, it's cheaper for me to go to a lab. And the accounting manager clearly showed me that's not the case and I don't have to pay for shipping. So let's start here. What's the target audiences? For example, let's use the Pro 100 and the Pro 1000 in this discussion. What okay. are the differences in, in target audiences there? So when we look at the Pro 100, we have that position towards uh, an advanced amateur, somebody that might be, like you were just saying, interested in making prints, but really not too sure uh, how to make a great print. They want something uh, better than a, a multifunction that they might have used in the past, a, a dedicated photo printer that can print up to 13 by 19. Um, so we see that as our, our entry or our foray into professional type printing. Um, when we look at the Pro 1000, we're now looking at a printer that can print up to 17 by 22. We're looking at the professional uh, that's starting to look at how I can monetize print, how I can bring that into my business, how I can make some additional money and, and revenue streams using print along with my photography. So people who want to, the monetizing is an interesting point, right? It's people who might want a wedding photographer on a smaller scale that wants to print and sell those prints at, at a profit. That Absolutely. Of so for the wedding photographer, oftentimes um, we know that they're going to be using labs. They're going to be making a, a bound book as their finished product. But if you look at what they might be doing for an engagement session, we know a lot of wedding photographers are using engagement settings to build rapport with their clients. So when they're uh, doing that afterwards, they might make a couple of prints uh, for that couple. Uh, sometimes they'll turn a 17 by 22 as a welcome in signboard to, to the wedding itself. Right. Yeah. Makes sense. So, okay. So then when you start looking at the differences in target audience, 
That then gets us to the differences in actual features. So as I said a, a few minutes ago, if you're printing on a Pro 100, what's retail cost on a Pro 100? Do you know that off the top of your head? Yeah, MSRP is uh, 499 right now. We have about $150 mail-in rebate in the okay. market. And I got mine with a bundle with my, my 5D Mark IV, actually. So when you're looking at the cost difference between that and twelve, thirteen hundred dollars for for a Pro 1000, there's a feature difference. And I'm, I, I commented earlier that the Pro 100 prints a beautiful print, right? I mean, if you're just printing Absolutely. for yourself, they print a great print. But you get some unique differences when you go to this level. And I want to start with the inks because that was a big one to me that I've been noticing in some of my samples. So what's the difference in ink between a 100 and a 1000? So when we're looking at the ink differences, the the first point to, to mention is that you're looking at a dye-based system versus a pigmented-based system. So the Pro 100 is using a dye-based system. The Pro 1000 is going to a pigmented-based system. So that's going to uh, help increase your longevity and the archivability of that print. Um, so that that's one of the major differences. And if you're you buy a lab print, that's what you're getting, right, is pigment usually? Most of the time, yep. Okay. Um, it also... Uh, has the difference of eight inks versus 12 inks. Um, so one of the things that we did was add some monochrome inks, um, and that will obviously play into our black and white prints, but also our, our color prints when you're looking at shadows and highlights. Which, which okay, let's get to monochrome for a minute. There's four inks just mm -hmm. for a monochrome print. Correct. Which is pretty interesting in and of itself. Now you said 12 inks, it's actually 11 pigments and then what's called a chroma optimizer. And Correct. it took me a little bit of research and understanding to understand what the chroma optimizer was and have it make sense to me, could you explain it probably better than me? Uh, hopefully, maybe. Um, I The purpose of the chroma optimizer um, on glossy papers, uh, when we look back at inkjet printing, uh, glossy services per, uh, had a cast that would come over it, a metamerism or a bronzing. So we use the chrome optimizer to level out the droplets. Uh, when you look at the surfaces of an inkjet paper, um, the pigments are, are absorbed by the paper, but a little bit is still going to be staying above that paper. So what that's going to do is level out the surface. So whether you're looking at it head on from an angle, depending on how you're holding the paper, um, you're not going to get any weird reflections that are going to alter the colors. Uh, the other uh, benefit of chrome optimizer is it, it actually helps us create a better black when we're printing on that semi-gloss or, or glossy type papers. See, and there's something I found interesting about the Chroma Optimizer. So as I was researching it and I realized that it's actually, like you say, for the gloss or semi-gloss type papers, because sometimes the ink will take the sheen away, but where there's less ink, you'll still get the sheen and it kind of evens that out is basically the way that I think of it. And I found something interesting. First of all, in most of the print dialog boxes, you can set it to use the chroma optimizer on the whole print instead of just the parts that its AI thinks it needs it. And then that's kind of a cool feature that is not thought of as a feature. So I had a, pa a paper that's kind of matte, but the manufacturer said when you print to it to choose a semi-gloss. What that caused was the Pro 100 printed it as a matte paper and it came out very matte looking. But the Pro 1000 threw the Chroma Optimizer on and gave a little bit of a sheen to it. But I can turn that off. So now on the Pro 1000, that same paper, I can literally almost change the sheen on, which was really cool. That's one way to use it. Um, the one caveat there would be that um, if you're not choosing a matte paper with a, with a matte surface, you're using our, our photo black versus our, our matte black ink. So you might adjust the density on the black. And again, that's something that a, a user can decide on their own and do some tests and play with and, and see how they like it. Kind of a personal taste type thing. So keeping exactly. on the ink. The Pro 100 had very small tanks and I would print a number of 13 by 19s and boom, I'd be out of ink. Mm -hmm. This thing's got 80 milliliter versus the old 13 milliliter tank. So it, it comes with a lot of ink. One thing I did notice during setup, and that was immediately when I pulled up the ink gauges, I was at 50%. And I thought, are these only like sample tanks? But it's not, right? It's the, the first no, 50%, it's not. So what something happens to it? Yeah, so th they're not sample starter sets of ink. Um, when you look at the differences between a 
Pro 100 and the Pro 1000 behind you, uh, one of the things you're going to notice right off the start is where the inks go. So on the Pro 100, they're going to sit right on top of the printhead. So the inks are going to fall literally right out of the cartridge onto the printhead and then onto your paper. The Pro 1000 uh, with the larger ink systems, obviously when that printhead is moving back and forth to print your image, we want it to be able to move as quickly as possible to, to make a, a great print in a fair amount of time. If those cartridges were on the top, the printer would be that much larger and the printhead would have to move that much smaller. So it uses a tubular ink delivery system. So it's like uh, the, when you when you go out and uh, buy your car, the first time that you put gas into it or the, the manufacturer puts gas into it, you have to get from the gas tank to the engine. Um, so it, it's priming the tubes within the, the printer to get ink to the, to the head. And that's a key distinction is you're not, it's not like you're losing the inks. No, you're and definitely not. One of the things that really, I saw this number and it's on your spec sheet. So it's got to be right. The Pro 100 has 6,000, what is it? I've got it written down, 6,144 nozzles. Mm -hmm. As opposed to the Pro 1000 has 1,536 nozzles per ink for a total of... 18,432. I just wanted you to say that because I knew you knew that by heart. <laughs> and that's 18,000 nozzles. So it has the ability, if there's a clog, to actually switch and move to another backup nozzle. That's really cool because we've all had those issues where you have clogged nozzles. This is what you're getting when you do, I'm not just doing this as an ad for this printer. I'm just saying, for, for going to higher level printers, that's the type of thing that you're getting is, is all of these ink design abilities that it has. So the other thing it has that I thought was interesting, and I don't know if I would really notice this, um, and that is the air feed. Explain the air feed, and will I as a user notice that this one has one versus the, like a Pro 100 that doesn't? So the, the air feed system was designed to be able to feed the paper through the machine in the best way possible. So what that air feed system is going to do is it creates a vacuum, and that vacuum is going to hold the paper to the platen of the printer, giving an equal height between the paper and the printhead. And that's going to allow the printer to create to place its droplets even more precisely. So when you're talking about droplets, uh, microscopic droplets as fine as, as the, the tip of your hair, um, we want to get them onto the paper as closely as possible to make the best image. Um, if the paper has any curl or the humidity in your environment is making uh, the paper uneven. Never thought about that. Yeah, okay. Um, the air feed system helps create that, that level even surface so that the droplets can be placed very, very precisely. It's almost like a it vacuum. Also, Exactly. Yeah. No, it is a vacuum inside of the printer. Um, it has skewed detection and correction. So if uh, your paper is not fed right, it'll be able to make some adjustments to be able to to fix that skewing automatically. So that way your print isn't bad, isn't something you have to tear up and throw away. Okay. So just to clarify one other big thing, and that is before I forget, the, the Pro 100 and a lot of those from all manufacturers, those kind of level of printers are 13 by 19 or A3 or A3 plus printers. This one is 17 by 22 for a printer. And then when you get to this level, again, you're increasing feature set, you're increasing a lot of things. So I just want people to understand when you're thinking about an upgraded printer, that's the kind of thing that you're looking at. There's a couple last things that I want to discuss. And that is the tools that come with this one that didn't come with the lower ones. And these are tools that to me are probably intended for more of a network environment or or professional environment. For example, I, I mentioned to you in the green room, as a network engineer by trade, I'm used to going and looking at the embedded web servers that are on a printer. And, and the features that are available on the lower printer in the, in the embedded web server were much less than what you get in this Pro 1000 where you can check ink status and a bunch of other things. It was actually really, I felt really at home there. But then you come up with tools like the media configuration tool, which I originally said to our mutual friend, Scott, that, you know, most people aren't going to use that. I'm, I'm going to print like a normal user. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to do the media configuration tool. And his response to me was, well, let's be honest. Most people who buy a printer like this probably would try it. I thought, you know, you got a good point. So I loaded some custom paper types and I loaded some AM1X files, which I got to say that actually to me was a huge deal. I wish that was available for all papers because when I go into the print dialog box, 
it shows me the actual paper instead of me having to open a manufacturer's PDF and go, okay, well, for paper, you know, 1920s cool paper, I have to choose photo paper plus semi-gloss. It, it listed the actual paper name. That was cool. Explain the media configuration tool to me. So the media configuration tool, like you said, is, is going to be for the, a little bit more of the advanced user that's trying to get as much as possible out of the printer. And what they're going to be able to do there is adjust fine settings within the printer. So they're going to be able to adjust dry time. They're going to be able to adjust paper feed. They're going to be able to adjust printhead height. And they're going to be able to adjust the amount of ink that hits the paper. Um, so this is for somebody that's at home um, or is somebody that's comfortable creating their own profiles and really wants to dial in and a little bit more to get more out of the printer. And, and actually, you mentioned printhead height, which is a huge one, because a lot of paper I print on is like 300 grams. And it says that you have to go in and do, you know, prevent abrasion, head abrasion. Correct. And that means every paper, you got to change it and you got to remember and you got to look at the settings. Whereas if you can program it in this tool, you just choose the paper and you're done. Uh, yeah, those, really are, cool. those adjustments will be made on the back end. Yep. And then last but not least is, is the accounting manager, which I'm not going to lie is, is quite possibly my favorite feature because this is what uh, convinced me that printing at home or print self-printing was actually not just less money, but in some cases pronouncedly less money. Like I've always done my printing mostly when I really cared about it through MPix. This These are way cheaper and I don't have to pay for printing the accounting manager allows a user to do what exactly? It's going to allow them to input all of the costs associated with the print. So each individual ink tank, as well as their paper type, and then they're going to be able to track the cost of the print. Um, so to, to your point about it being affordable, um, this puts the numbers right in front of you and lets you see what each and every print is, is going to cost. Um, it's, was designed for uh, a lab type environment um, or a multi-user environment. Um, the studio that's that's cranking out a bunch of prints for them to be able to track their cost and, and put their markup in it, even if they wanted to, um, so that they knew what to charge the the end user uh, once they they hand off that finished product. Yeah, and I got to say the instructions could be a little easier. It was it took me a while to figure it out, but when and I'm hopefully a little tech savvy, but when I got in there and got it working and I saw the numbers, that was a big aha moment for me because it, you know, every time you go buy and you, you go and buy consumables, which are not cheap, you think to yourself, wow, this is a lot. It's not when you figure in and see the costs. It was actually, even if you're, you're not a big print house, if you're printing that one signing picture for a bride and groom to use at their wedding, you know exactly what it costs. Like you say, you know, even for a small wedding photographer, a portrait or headshot photographer, you know exactly how to calculate the cost. It was a really cool tool to me. Is there anything that's else? One of the, Go ahead. I was just going to say that that's one of the major misconceptions about printing. Um, a lot of people believe that going out to the labs is cheaper and, and there are great labs out there that are going to produce great work for you. And, and some of them will even guarantee that they're going to reprint it until they get it right. Um, this gives you the, the ultimate control as the, the image creator and, and what your, you bring your work to life through it. So you're able to make that adjustment if it doesn't come out right. Um, one of the tools in the Print Studio Pro plugin um, is the pattern print capability. So if you're somebody that's not uh, too comfortable with with making adjustments to images or you haven't mastered Photoshop yet, um, both the Pro 100 and, and Pro 1000 have the ability within the included software to make a pattern print that's going to adjust the CMYK values of a print, gives you the numbers, and you're able to plug that in to get the, the final output. Um, so that'll print a, a thumbnail of the image uh, up to 25 times on a 13 by 19 sheet, and you're able to see with the good size what the, the final print would look like and make those adjustments yourself. So there are tools in it that are going to be able to help you if you're not uh, the, the most savvy printer in the world to be able to get a great print without having to make tons and tons of prints over and over again, wasting that ink that that does have a cost associated with it. Yeah. And I do think there's a lot of misconceptions and I had them until I started doing this whole show and test on, on printing. You know, one of them being, for example, paper, which is why I'm going to talk to Drew from Red River Paper, because understanding what paper you print on also can make a big difference on on whether or not 
a photo between, and by the way, that's one of the other really cool things is by printing at home. If I go to some service online, I can choose metallic and semi-gloss and matte and a bunch of, and they might have a, but with my own printer, I can go buy a Moab or a Canon or an Ilford or a Red River paper. I can buy a Berita. I can buy a canvas. I can buy, you know, a cotton. I mean, there's, there's a lot of options that are now in my hand. And again, these are all features. So First of all, I want to say congratulations because as I'm doing this show, I'm doing research. Lightstocking.com just named this printer the best photo printer of 2019. It's a great article. I'll have a link to that in the show notes, by the way. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Uh, is there anything else, not so much even the Pro 1000, but is there anything else that you being around printing for a living would say that if somebody is looking at doing their own prints... What is their deciding factor to you or what should they know that we didn't talk about between going with that $450 printer and something more like this one behind me, regardless of manufacturer, just in general, what does somebody need to know to buy or to trigger them to go, oh yeah, I need the higher printer? I mean, the higher printer, like we mentioned, uh, has larger ink tanks, so that's going to reduce their cost. But if we even take a step back from before that, uh, one thing that we didn't talk about was the importance of, of calibration. So I think that that's something that that somebody that's going to get into printing, um, whether it be a, a color monkey or, or data color uh, spectrophotometer to measure and, and calibrate your screen, I, I think that's always a great starting point for somebody. Um, one of the biggest displeasures people have when they print is that what's on their screen isn't what they see on on their printer. Oh, yeah. um, we as a manufacturer do everything we can to, to, to make it as, as accurate as possible should somebody not calibrate their monitor. But I always think that, that that's a quick, easy starting point. Um, the, there's a lot of inexpensive, great solutions out there that will help you be satisfied with your print and take some of the frustration out of it. So I would always recommend starting there and, and, and calibrate your monitor and, and that'll help you get a better print. And the other thing is understand printing a little bit. So for example, well, you know what, I'm going to save that mostly for the end when I do my review, but, but let me just say, I learned a long time ago from a video that I saw online and it was from somebody I'll mention in the, in the end of the show that, you know, prints often people complain, the most common complaint is that they're darker than what they see on screen, like what you say. And, and when you're printing from Lightroom, there is an adjust the print option to increase brightness or contrast. And their default that I saw in this video was plus 25, which is what I've always used. And it's always done, it's always served me very, very well. What I found when I went to the higher end printer that has increased monochrome ink counts and 11 plus the chroma optimizer as opposed to eight was that that plus 25 no longer worked because this printer can print the detail in those shadows, right? I needed that brightness to get that other printer to lighten up a little bit in those dark areas. Whereas here I can print it zero plus 10 and get, I mean, a really close match, uh, you know, assuming I've got everything else dialed in ICC profiles, et cetera, which I'll talk about when we talk about paper. So Jim, uh, thank you so much for, for doing this and joining me. I really appreciate it. Your lights just went really weird. That was kind of cool. It was like psychedelic. Auto sensors in the room. I guess I was sitting too still. Ah, they turned <laughs> off. Well, Jim Booth from Canon, thank you so much. People can find Canon at usa.canon.com. And then all the social media, if I'm not mistaken, it's always Canon USA, right? Yep, at Canon USA. Okay, perfect. Jim, thanks so much for joining me, man. I really Steve, appreciate thanks it. thanks for having me. So as I was looking at this printer and starting to think about how I was going to do my testing, thinking about the differences between the Pro 1000 and the Pro 100, I hit a wall. As I started doing some of my test prints, I suddenly realized that what I wanted to do was print the same photo on the same paper on both printers. But then I also wanted to use different papers on each printer. And I started realizing I don't know anything really about paper. It's just an area I'm confused on. And I actually think it's one of the reasons a lot of people don't print is because they can be confused by the choices of paper. And then it hit me. I actually know somebody who knows something about paper. <laughs> and that's when I reached out to Red River Paper and I'm honored to have Drew Hendricks of Red River Paper, the president of Red River Paper with me. Drew, how are you today? I'm good. Thanks for having me. I um, it. Believe me, the pleasure is all mine because, and I think you understand what I mean, doing what you do, 
when I started deciding, okay, I'm going to do the Palo Duro Smooth. I'm going to do the Palo Duro Soft Gloss. You know, I'm going to do the Beretta, the brand new Beretta. As I started choosing the papers and using the same papers, three or four papers on both printers printing photos, then it hit me, okay, all I did was make a random choice of paper. Why? And now I'm printing a black and white picture versus a picture that has lots of shadow detail that may not come out versus a picture that's full of color and vibrant. And I was just lost. And I figure that that hopefully you'll be able to help us a little bit. Before we get into talking paper, I do want to mention, depending on when you watch this, I have been doing some regular contests, thanks to Drew with Red River Paper. He sent me some sample packs to try. I fell in love with the paper. And since then, we've been doing some contests where you can win one of 10 Red River Paper sample packs. We've been doing it quarterly. And then one of those winners will get a 13 by 19 custom print that Drew does at Red River Paper on his paper of the education guest that I have on my show at any given point in time. And if you want the rules and the information and what contests are currently running, as always, just go to the website. It's behindtheshot.tv. Check out the contest menu, and that will give you all the information that you need on any contest. But before we get into this, that actually something else just clicked that isn't in my notes I wanted to talk to you about. Okay. I'm doing these education episodes and we're doing these contests, but the reason that I really started doing the education episodes is because I was fascinated by the fact that a company like yours participates in education programs at colleges and universities around the country. And so once a quarter, I've gotten a student from one of those programs to generically talk about the state of photography education and their use in that program of Red River Paper. What got you started in, oh, in, boy. in working with education systems. Right. Um, I guess it's two, two parts. Um, one is the philosophical, it's just the other overriding idea that um, there needs to be more education <clears throat> towards um, the output side of photography. And it, um, over the years, what we've noticed is there is, and this is, I'm not the first to notice this, is that there is a pullback from the output side. I mean, you know, we were talking about this kind of before the segment um, that you know, people tend to think of printing last. And uh, what I, by that, I mean, they don't really think of it at all in some cases. And so we kind of went to some schools nearby, we're in Dallas, and talked to them about their programs. And all of the educators are interested in output, but they really didn't know kind of where to go. Because after the darkroom started to sort of slide, then um, the digital darkroom or the, the inkjet printers really only had a little kind of penetration into the education market. There, there was just a gap there. So we thought, okay, you know, let's go talk to educators and let them talk to students and get them excited about Again, because, you know, back in the, quote, old days, photography wasn't photography unless it was printed. Right. <laughs> well, now we can skip over that completely. So the idea was to get the end of that system and to at least reintroduce it, um, not like they didn't know it existed, but to help them with this education portion that you and I were talking about. And then the other uh, part is that we watch who orders from us. And um, over the last 10 years, the number of .edu email addresses has been increasing. So for the That's longest time, you know, younger people weren't doing a lot of printing, and now they are apparently without, you know, either because of the chicken egg, because we went out there and, and tried to get it, them to be engaged, or they started doing it on their own. More and more students, more and more teachers are ordering. And the funny part is more than not, uh, at least it was like that, and it's kind of changing a little bit. If we would go to a conference, um, the SPE is a conference. It's an educational conference where teachers go, and they um, they all kind of get together, and students are there. We found that more students were telling their teachers about us rather than the other way around. So really, they were yeah they the younger kids right they go out and they're doing research and they're listening to their friends and they're doing social media and we pop up because we're active in these social media channels for people to kind of share their work that they print on us. More professors are telling us that, well, you know, the, the kid came up and said, this is on Red River. And 
it's totally the opposite of what we show, st- shot for in the first place. But it's a happy circumstance because, yeah. you know, the whole marketing thing is you want the teacher to tell the student and the student becomes the teacher and then it just keeps going. Yeah, it's the but circle it was, of education. Out, yeah, but it turned out the other way around. So that was kind of, it's kind of cool. Well, and and that kind of brings me into, you, you said something that I firmly believe, which is part of the reason I'm doing this review completely on its own. And that is I've had printers. The first printer that I got was a 9,000 Mark II. And later in this episode, I'll talk about how that happened and stuff. And then I had a Pro 100. And now I've got this Pro 1000 that Canon sent me to test. And I've always been a believer that really there's something magical about holding a print in your hand. And I've always sent my stuff out because of things that I thought in my head were obstacles to me printing here. Difficulty, consumable cost, um, you know, all of those type of things, understanding color management. As I've moved into the more expensive and higher end printer that's behind me, thanks to H, uh, thanks to Canon for that, I've started to realize that most of that preconception is wrong. The cost is cheaper as I'm printing on my own. In fact, this printer actually, you own this printer, I think. The, oh, yeah. the, the, there's an accounting manager on this printer that tells you how much a print costs. And when I first looked at that, my thought was, it's got to be wrong because it was cheaper than me ordering through a service. So then some yeah. prints were coming out, which I'll talk about in a later segment. Some prints were coming out. I'm thinking these are as good as anything I'm getting from a lab. So it it kind of radically changed my opinion on self-printing, which then brought me to the paper thing. If I order from a lab, I'm limited to the papers that they have. Now, they may have a metallic and they may have a gloss and everything, but I can't choose from multiple different types of Berita or multiple different types of gloss or textures or whatever. And self-choosing paper gives me some advantages there. So that's kind of why I wanted to get you on. What are... if it, if you were standing up at a podium at a conference and you were trying to educate photographers that really don't know anything about paper, pointing at me as I'm saying this, right. what are the key differences of the the general types of paper that are out there? Okay. So I do a talk on this and um, it's kind of changed a little bit over the time, but I'll, I'll make it as short and sweet as possible. Um, inkjet paper has morphed a little bit over time, although I will say that we are at the technological pinnacle and plateau for paper technology. The coating that's put onto the paper, it's not going to really get a whole lot better. The printer behind you represents kind of the top end, the pinnacle of what a photo inkjet printer can do. And yeah, any day of the week, you can exceed a lab if you just set it right and you have a good file. So paper can be broken down into uh, three, four, sometimes five categories. And um, to make it easy, there are papers that are reflective and there are papers that are not reflective. So that's your two okay. um, master categories. And then the substance the paper's made out of, you can either have tree or you can have cotton. So there can be tree paper that's glossy and not. There can be cotton paper that's glossy and not. And that's four of them right there. And that's four right there. And um, by gloss, we have varying amounts of gloss. So if you think about a typical glossy photo paper um, that would be made of trees, and um, maybe it may or may not have heard it called resin coated or photo base. And this is paper that has plastic on both sides and coating on the top. This paper became the primary photo paper in about 1973 is when the United States switched over to this RC paper. And everybody knows what it is. Everybody's touched a lab print at some point. If you're over the age of like 20 or 25, probably have touched a lab print. So that glossy paper is smooth and highly glossy. And then you work your way steadily towards less and less gloss until you have no gloss, completely flat and non-reflective. And that level of gloss and the texture is what where it starts to get not necessarily complicated but more nuanced and that's where uh, personal preference and um, preconceived notions come into play about what kind of paper you want for the image that you're printing okay Um, but on a kind of a really high level 
glossy and semi-gloss papers are the more high-performance paper. They have a greater gamut and a greater black density. And so the, we nerds say D-max, meaning the deepest black that a paper can make with a specific printer. And then you kind of slide down the scale towards the matte papers. They're going to be less reflective. They're going to have less color gamut and the, the black density will fall. But sort of a weird thing happens. And um, we talk about this for people who are like landscape photographers or people who have a lot of detail that they're wanting the, the viewer to see is that with less gloss comes more detail, um, ease, of, ease of visualization of a detail. So if you've got a really highly detailed image of a canyon or something like that, and you want the viewer to see every little thing about that canyon without having to sort of hold the paper and move it and turn it, then a matte paper might actually be the better choice rather than a gloss because you've got these reflections and these right. specular highlights that are popping off of it. So we get into sort of a detailed but fairly easy to understand process on our website where we ask you, what kind of, what kind of paper do you like? And then over here we say, what kind of image are you printing? And then over here we might say, what size do you want? So the point is, we know that you have your own ideas about what you want, but the, the person down the street may be very different in how they think and how they shop. So we're trying to build systems that allow you to find the exact right paper because my number one goal is to have customers, have our sort of partners, people who are into this sort of thing with us, not get frustrated. Because I think you've probably going to mention with your Pro 9000 in the past, it was easier to get frustrated than it is now. The printer yes. behind you represents much more of a click the button and have it work rather than go and have to cast spells and point the right direction and hope that things are going to work right. Yeah, no, and cast, you know what's funny? The 9000 Mark II worked almost every time. It's just the prints didn't come out like I expected. Yeah, okay. The 100 I had more problems getting even it to take a paper feed and it would wow. be sitting in there and it wouldn't take the feed and it was brand new out of the box. Yeah. This thing. And I'll, again, I'll get into this for those of you watching it or listening in a, in a segment when I talk about the printer itself, but this thing was literally plug and play. And as long as yeah. you understand some of the basics of setting up printing, but you made an interesting comment when you were describing using a matte paper for something that's detailed versus a gloss paper um, because of the gloss, it might be harder to see the detail. And that's one of the other things I think, I think people misread, oh, printing at home is hard. My, my prints aren't coming out like I expect them or the biggest complaint. My print doesn't look like what I see on the screen. And yep. it's one of the biggest things I try and explain to people just on a base level. And that is your screen is a backlight. It's rear lit. Right. Prints are reflective light. They're never going to look exact. Plus, right. you have a different color gamut on both and a different color profile on both. So you can get them close. They're rarely going to be exact. But if you print on a certain paper A, let's say a matte paper where you lose that gloss, it may not look anything like what you have on screen because now you're getting the characteristics of that paper. That's the beauty of it. Yeah, exactly. Right? I mean, it truly you, is. you can choose. So that... that leads me to this question. You mentioned detail for Matt, but there's got to be more to it than, than that as far as deciding factors on why you choose paper A over paper B. I know black and white right. plays a role. Color saturations play a role. So when right. you're choosing an image at a helicopter view, when you're choosing, I'm sorry, when you're choosing a paper to print an image on from a helicopter point of view, what are some of the base guidelines? Well, I think there's a couple of questions that you have to ask yourself when you are doing this. And, um, and you brought up a good point about the fact that some papers can shift either your expectations because you push the button, it comes out, you look at it and you say, well, this is not at all like I was expecting or, and, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's just different than the perception that the, the transmitted light at you from the monitor is relative to, like you said, the reflective light, but you, you need to ask yourself, um, are you looking for an easy path? Or are you looking for a more creative path? Because an easy answer is, look, I just have prints I want to make. 
I want to share them. I want to hang them up. And I just want them to look like they looked in my head through my eyes when I was shooting that image. So picking that kind of paper is fairly simple. And um, I would say, you know, you quickly can come to the conclusion of a satin or a semi-gloss paper because okay. it's not overly reflective. It's not underly reflective, if that's even a word. And it has a high performance ratio and good blacks, and they're just going to work. Okay. Right. So that's, I'll put that, that segment of people who may be listening to us as that group. They're in the silo and they just want it to work. And then there is a segment who's going to be listening to you because you're breaking down all of these details and specs and, and creativity of photography. So let's talk about people who want, well, they want more out of it. You know, they want to see something different. They want the zest of They want it to become part of their post-processing in a way. Exactly. Right, right. And so when you're looking at that, you, you're you going to choose your paper based on what speaks to you. And that's, and I'm, again, not as a pitch, but as an idea that sample kits, like, you know, you got some kits from us and I'm sure you've gotten kits from other other paper companies. Having the sample kit there with the same image or kind of a montage of your images printed on every one of them is almost a requirement so that you know what your work looks like on the paper. So I, I'm sounds like I'm dodging the question and I'm not, I'm going around in a circle and I'm going to get there, but you, you really need to know what Matt means because if you, have me describe it on our website with some pictures, you're not really going to know what it is. So if you're picking a paper, you need to think about the emotion of the image that you are printing. So let's talk about um, a portrait. So a portrait can either be can either be happy or it can be sad. It can be warm. It can be cool. It can be bright. It can be dark. But the emotion of it kind of matches along with the emotion of the paper. So glosses tend to be more bright emotion. They tend to be more, um, uh, I'm trying to think of a good word for it, not necessarily bouncy, but more like- Almost like a pop. Up, a pop, right. Kind of up. And then you, you work your way down to a non-reflective, like a textured, uh, heavy cotton paper. That's not necessarily the opposite of gloss, but it's more thoughtful, more, um, uh, I guess, slow than- See, the, one, the, one that, the word that hit me when I, I printed on, on some of it was, it, it's, it's more wall art. Yeah, it, it's not exactly. wall portrait. It's, it's less o right. Olin Mills and more gallery. <laughs> right, right, and and that's how it's sold, right? If you if you look at all the big brands and how they sell these papers, like these cotton art papers are a tiny percentage of our total sales of this kind of paper on the market today. If you want to talk about where tons are, the tons are all in satin papers, right? Okay. Because that's what people want, right? But when you when you open this world up of these more fine photography papers, there are lots of them. There's probably 150 of them you can choose from on, on a worldwide basis. But you know, kind of back to the emotion of it, um, you know, you would probably not print uh, the Thunderbirds in a pass and review, you know, five or six fighter aircraft on a textured cotton art paper, but you right. would print them on a glossy metallic, right? And if you were printing a picture Ooh, that, that you That actually recolored, on metallic would be kind of cool. It, well, it is cool. I've got one in my wall oh, okay. and um, right, yeah. it's, it's, you know, anything, anything that is metallic like aircraft and, and boats and, and uh, buildings and stuff like that looks really cool on photo metallic. But if you're printing, say, a photograph that you uh, you restored of your grandmother, and chances are she's not going to look so great on metallic, right? But the emotion of it is maybe a semi-gloss barita, something that looks like oh, paper okay. that would have been used back when she was, you know, young. You just said the word, and I, I've I've looked it up, and and depending on where you look, it's barita or barita. <laughs> well, explain to me because I'm not going to lie. This I think I've got one next to me. Hold on. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I've got, these are both actually on the Barita, but there's something about this paper. I'm not mm -hmm. going to lie when I printed it and this is the Red River paper Barita, but 
Um, you know, you can, there's a lot of different Baritas out there. I just happen to have Red River Paper Barita because you were kind enough to send me samples. But when I printed on the Barita, I'm, I had never used a Barita paper before. And I'm not going to lie, it's actually one of the most amazing smiles I've ever had on my face because it came cool. out with this really interesting, it's not matte, it's like you say, it's not matte, but it's not right. gloss, but it's got a pop, but it retains darks and shadow detail, right? Mm. So I'm guessing that like a Barita would be good for a solid black and white shot. It would, and um, it would because it's got the dynamic range to work for a black and white. If you, in, you know, if you talk about the zones all the way, you know, from one up to I guess it's six, and it they can handle because of the coating, they can handle that differential. Um, also, from the emotional standpoint, that would have been the paper type to some degree, almost exactly, and to some degree, kind of a loose approximation of a darkroom fiber-based paper from 1962. Oh, okay. All right. So and that explains they, a lot. Yeah. That, that's why they, that's why they exist by the way, is because somebody said, well, we had paper like that a long time ago. Why don't we do it again? And well, they did. And so that paper is like the one that you've got in your hand, I think it's probably the newer Paladuro Barita. Yeah. And that paper has, what was a Barita 300 or something like that? It, it is. That's the the weight is three hundred grams uh, per square meter, and it is. Um, I don't know if they designed it like this. The paper mill that we contract to make it, but um, we had it. We had we carried it some time ago, and we moved away from it and came back. And the more research I did into older papers, it is a dead ringer for a product um, made by a company called Oriental, which made a paper that they called Seagull. And Seagull G was Ansel Adams sort of one of his two go-to papers. That so, explains why it does black and white so well. Yeah, it, it just works for it on on a technical, but also that emotional level because it looks like you would have made it yourself. And what you did, really. Okay, so so far my favorite is the Barita, but again, more later in this episode on paper choices. So one of the things that people, obviously you want to do when you are printing yourself is an ICC profile. Well, that's not paper specific in, in the sense of, you know, you can get ICC profiles for any paper. The one area I've heard people confused about is the printer. I can go to the page for the printer, the support page for the printer, and I can download ICC profiles for any major paper company's paper from Canon, from right. Epson, from whatever. But also I can go to Red River Paper and download ICC profiles for any printer in the reverse order. So I guess my question right. is, given the choice of using the printer manufacturer's ICC profiles versus the paper manufacturer ICC profiles, which right. should I choose? Okay, so I think we probably can... Um, I'm not sure. So I, I bet what happened was you went to Canon's website and they have some of, they have our products and they have some other paper uh, company products listed on their site, right? Yeah. For ICC profiles. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's, but I can go get them from you too. Are they the yeah, same? Yeah. they're the same profile. It is. Yeah, they are because Canon is very different than their big competitor in that they are, um, highly open and relaxed about, media or paper manufacturers. So they actually approached us and the other manufacturers like Moab and Ilford and whoever else. And they said, you know, we get that you guys exist. And we like the fact that you are bothering to can keep pushing printing and talking about it and making it something people should do. So can we Post your profiles on oh, our site. It literally is the same profile. They are the same. They they basically called us and said, "We'd like to approve you as a, a media partner." Okay, but you mentioned is, their competitors may not do that. So let's take a hypothetical of an Epson or whoever. If a manufacturer right. makes their own profiles, and a paper company, whoever it is, makes their own profile, so now you have competing profiles, right? right. Made independent of each other. Manufacturer right. bought your paper, printed on their printers, made a profile. You did right. your own pro. Who should I choose? Should I favor the paper company, which is oh, what I've sure. been doing? 
Um, probably it does. If that happened, and 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 it it, it real rare that it would do that. Like okay. Epson um, is Epson's not going to do that because they they're. I mean, and I'm not speaking out of turn or anything. Their corporate um, line or their corporate concept is that the only paper that's that's acceptable is their products. And that's just a corporate decision they've made over the years is that they defend that section of their, of their revenue. Gotcha. And Canon doesn't seem, I think Canon cares, but Canon doesn't defend that revenue stream at all. Really. They are all comers have at it. Let's have fun. Okay. So if, um, when we have our profiles made, we actually outsource them because, um, I've worked with a company called Chromix for about 15 years, and they are the definitive experts at doing this um, really in North America. So we buy all the printers, we print all the targets, and then we send them to Chromix. And the app, let's just say Epson did the same thing. They're going to probably use the same hardware, probably going to use the same software, and you know they've got engineers who know what they're doing. So I don't really think that one over the other would be Interesting. Necessarily the best, but I would say that if you um, if you ran into that situation, try both. But I have a feeling most of the time would be either be either or. Epson makes Epson paper profiles. That's kind of a we myth make. busted to me because I've heard people always say choose the the paper manufacturer. That's fascinating. So there's one other file I want to talk about re just really briefly because I wasn't aware of this file. Okay. And I'm a network engineer by trade, but I do I, I just don't have a lot of printing experience, and that's an AM1X file. And yeah. when I when I downloaded your ICC profiles, it had a folder in it, AM1X, and I'm like, I don't even know what that is. <laughs> and I went and I researched it. <laughs> and right. uh, I at first it was like, okay, I'm doing this as a test for this printer and a review of this printer, and I really want it to be like a real person thing, and most people are not gonna install these. And then a mutual friend of ours said to me, well, if somebody owns that printer, they probably will. I went, you know, that's a really good point. So let me do both. Right. Then I realized there are AM1X files for some paper, but not others, which let me easily do both. And right. I fell in love with them. And I'm going to explain why. When you install the AM1X file, it solves me opening a PDF every time I print on a different paper from the manufacturer, scrolling down and saying, okay, for this paper, you want to, in your print dialog box, choose, you know, glossy N. Right. <laughs> or Right. Because yeah. when I load the AM1X file, it preloads the settings on the printer that are some unusual settings, such as printer height, things like that. Right. But at the same time, it, it installs in the printer dialog in the print driver so that now I have a paper type in my print driver. Is there any other reason other than those conveniences, which to me was huge, because as I'm doing these tests and I'm changing papers constantly, I had to keep going, okay, for this paper, what was the print, what was the paper type I'm supposed to choose? Semi-gloss and, right. you know, photo paper, you know, cool. I, I, you know, it was there. I chose the actual paper name. Yeah. Is there any other reason for the AM1X that I, as a user, would want to use it? Uh, on a regular basis, no. Um, it is, for the Pro 1000 specifically, it um, is, we call them, they're also called config files or a configuration file. And that configuration takes care of that renaming the media type and, or creating a media type. It does the paper, uh, the print head uh, distance from the paper and Epson call uh, Canon calls it print uh, prevent paper abrasion, which is right. to mean stay away from uh, thicker papers need more clearance. It also changes. But that's the vacuum not to protect pressure. the head, right? That's to protect the, the print. So the head doesn't scratch the print. That's right. The, the head's pretty robust. It can, I've run, I've run a print heads into all sorts of different kinds of papers and I've never broken anything. I mean, and, and up to the point where they just seize up and stop working and then you have to turn it off, turn it back on and it starts working again. Um, it has a vacuum in that printer too, that pulls the paper down uh, away from the head. Right. And then it also has some density stuff where it is setting um, levels of color density or ink density. But unless you're using really exotic media, like something like a, um, a film or a foil that's been coated, those are really persnickety products. But I'd say that less than 2% of Pro 1000 users even have access to them. So okay. beyond the, beyond the um, 
the 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 uh, convenience of it. There's really, you know, that's really what they're. For. I gotta say, it, for me, one of my big things on not printing myself was the fact that every time I switched paper, I had to open the manufacturer PDF to find out what paper type I'm supposed to use with that paper. Right. And that feature alone of choosing the paper type with the actual name, I would almost buy these AM1X files. (laughs) It was, it it made printing, put the paper in, choose it, if I do that, I don't have to, on this printer, you you usually have to go up to the printer and say the paper type. Right. If I do it here and it's the right AM1X file, I can trust exactly that it's got everything right. And I don't have to walk to the printer. The convenience feature was just huge. So, yeah. okay, so here's another uh, question. Can it work in reverse? So can a certain paper work on printer A, but not be good for printer B? Can the printer B the deciding factor as opposed to the paper? Uh, these days, it's um, unlikely okay. for that to happen. Um, it's too roll back 10 years ago. And yes, the difference between... Even with the different a- types of inks? Because, you know, for example, you have dye inks, you have pigment inks. You could still use, you know, like this one is a pigment ink and the Pro 100 right. is a dye ink as an example. I could still use any paper I want in either one. For the most part, yes. There are a few papers left on the market that are dye-only papers. They are um, sort of either being phased out or they're being used by a real specific niche. Um, out of our 30, 31 products that we carry, I now have one that is technically for dye ink only. Every other paper is cross-compatible. But yeah, if you had asked me that question 10 years ago, it may have been close to 50-50. But now, because the inks have gotten more sophisticated and the coatings are now um, a lot more harmonized uh, across um, the manufacturers, across different coating facilities, then you don't really have to worry about that anymore. Okay, that's good to know. Uh, Anything else, somebody? It's funny, I I intended this to be 10 to 15 minutes, but I'm enjoying the conversation. We're at 30 minutes already so far. This is awesome. This is a huge (laughs) learning thing. This is a printer review episode, but really, honestly, this is big to me. This is part of using a printer is choosing the paper. Is there anything else that you as a paper guy would, would say that people should think or know when they're doing their own prints? Boy, there's a lot, to be honest. Okay, Um, your, your big one. Yeah, I'm trying to think of the big one. Just let, uh, let me uh, spin across the uh, the Rolodex in my mind. That also dates me. Um, <laughs> th- there are, um, if I was to say one thing to the person who came to us and said, I want to start printing, I would say, get a sample kit. And the reason is because it's so emotional and so subjective that um, we want people to see what's available. And at least, you know, and our goal at, at Red River, at least, is to have something from all of the all the genres of paper, from glossy to like we talked about, to something that's So more people can go to your website to get a sample pack. Yes, and, and we, we sell them and we try to make them a very, um, at least a cost-effective, they're just a few dollars, and you don't have to get big kits. You can just get them segmented by, and you can go to the site and see, but they're segmented out so that you can pick and choose what um, papers you want, what papers you don't get. But if somebody came to me and said, I'm going to start, I would A, I'd ask them what printer they had, and then I would direct them to the sample kit so that they could figure out what they like and then just invite them to call back. That's the point of a small company like ours is that we have a phone, we answer it, and you know, I answer questions that are completely unrelated to our product line every single day. And it's because I need people to be comfortable with the printing process and to not fear little things here and there that they think might slow them down. We can, you know, take it easy. It's just this, push the button and you'll be good. Yeah, perfect. And and again, the sample kit came to me and I loved it. And keep in mind that we are doing the uh, the sample kit giveaways, hopefully still when you watch this, they're still going, but you can always go to behindtheshot.tv, go under the contest menu and see what exact contests are happening at any given point in time. It'll have instructions on how you enter. But either way, whatever your paper choice is, get yourself some pa- sample packs. For you, Drew, Red River Paper is at redriverpaper.com. Social media, your Red River Paper everywhere, right? That's right. At Red River everywhere you can think of. Well, I really appreciate your coming on. 
and yeah, for the great time. combination giveaway stuff. I really appreciate it. Yeah. yeah, we're happy to help. Happy to get the word out and, you know, get more people printing. And um, like you said before, you don't print everything because that's wasteful. And we just don't do that really anymore. But if you were to have an emotional ping with an image that you shot on your last vacation or with friends and family or when you go do something special, print it. It doesn't have to be big either. Four by six, five by seven, eight by ten. Put them somewhere because that touch, that going over, that sharing with friends other than just handing them your dirty phone and say, look at what I did. Your smudged iPad screen. Yeah, exactly. And especially if you have kids. So the idea is it's just a great way to connect each other. And um, we just enjoy the heck out of it. Well, again, thank you very much to Drew Hendricks of Red River Paper for joining me. Again, this is this turned into a long paper segment, but it was actually really fascinating to me because it kind of sets up for the next segment where I actually want to talk about my experience with this printer the prints that I've done, all the sample prints, and I've got a stack of them sitting here next to me on various paper. I've used Red River paper a lot. I've used some Ilford paper. I've used some Canon paper. So in the next segment, I'm going to talk a little bit about my thoughts of the printer and kind of what I think of it overall from a real world point of view, not a numbers game. There's a million sites you can go get numbers if you want. This is going to be more from a real world point of view and what I see in pictures. So let's head on over and take a look at the prints. And that brings us to the final segment of the show, my opinion of the Canon Image Prograph Pro 1000 printer. And I've got a lot of opinions on this printer. Before I get started, let me say that I understand you may have skipped the unboxing and the interview with Canon and the interview with Red River Paper to come right to the opinion portion of the show. That's absolutely fine. But I may reference some things that they said during those interviews. So if there's something that happens during this last part, where it makes you feel like you missed something, head back to those. I think there's a lot of good content there and it might fill in some gaps for you if that's the case. So here we go. First of all, this printer is a lot more than what I expected. I fully expected that I would get really good prints from the Canon Image Prograph Pro 1000 printer, better than my Canon Pro 100, but I didn't expect this good. I mean, there were times they were shockingly good, like aha moment type good. And I printed a lot of images on this thing too. And, and kind of what I noticed in the short version, we'll get more into detail on it, was the shadow area. There was a lot more detail in the shadows and also the ability for this printer to handle images that have a wide color gamut. The color uh, reproduction on this printer is absolutely amazing. Now, it's going to depend on the image that you send to the printer, but I think that you can get some amazing prints out of it. Now, one of the things I immediately noticed was compared to the old Pro 100 printer that I had, and even the 9000 Mark II before that, this printer at the actual task of printing a print is much faster. At times, it takes about half the amount of time to print on this one than it did on the Pro 1000. That's one of the advantages of getting a higher level printer. Also, the specs show that this one is louder than the Pro 100 by ever so slightly much. I wondered about that because when I printed on it, it was really quiet. I mean, noticeably quiet. I could have printed a print on this thing while my wife was sleeping in the room next door. I didn't, which is probably a good thing for me, but it was shockingly quiet. And so when I did the interview with Jim Booth of Canon, I asked him, Why does it say this thing is so loud? And it made perfect sense to me, his answer. When they measure the loudness of a printer, they're not measuring the loudness of a print process. They're measuring the loudest point the printer can get. And with this thing having the large 80 milliliter tanks, when it does warm up and agitates those ink tanks, that can get fairly loud. So that's what they're measuring. But just be aware, the actual process of printing a print on this this printer much, much more quiet. I printed a number of different test prints. I can't show you the prints, but I kind of want to go through and let you see the digital files so that you understand what I'm talking about when we discuss what I'm seeing coming out of this printer compared to my old printer, the Pro 1000. So first up, let's talk about this black and white Joe Bonamassa print. This is taken at an old theater here in my hometown. And you'll see Joe's on stage. Joe Bonamas is a well-known blues guitarist. You'll see that Joe is on stage to the right-hand side. There is a pillar on the left-hand side. There's detail in the shadows of that pillar. Well, what you get out of the Pro 1000 compared to the Pro 100 was pronouncedly different. That was actually one of the aha moments when this one came out. It was, whoa, 
I've seen it on screen. I've never seen it in print. It did an amazing job. Next up, this is a color image. This is of the band Garbage, specifically the, the lead vocalist for Garbage, Shirley Manson. This one is a tough print. There's a lot of dynamic range in this print, and there's a lot of saturation in this print. So color gamut wise, the Pro 100 has trouble specifically with that whole upper left corner. Pro 1000, not a problem at all. Next up, we've got the uh, shot of Bruce Watson of Foreigner off the ground. I love this image. It's a great print image because there's a lot of shadow in the background, but there's people back there. There's detail back there. You can see detail in the lighting truss up above and his outfit and his hair really show off well. This one is one of the images that actually prints pretty well on the Pro 100. Still, however, better on the Pro 1000. Along with printing my own images, I decided to print some test images. So I've got two test images that I want to show you so you understand what I'm talking about. First one is from Data Color, and this test image I like because it's a lot of thumbnails. And you've got images that have lots of saturation, and you've got black and white, and you've got skin tones, and you've got dark skin tones in shadow. So there's a lot of options here, a lot of opportunity here for a printer to do really well, or for that matter, not to do really well. Both printers printed this test image really well, but there's two squares that I think really stood out as hugely different. The third image from the left, I think it is, with the young lady and the skin tone. Her skin tone looked good on both printers, but was not really accurate on the Pro 100. On the Pro 1000, much more accurate. And right below that is a gentleman with darker skin in a shadowed room holding a stand-up base. And in the Pro 100 case, it could not in any manner, shape, or form separate him from the shadows. The Pro 1000, did I say the Pro 100 on the last one? I think so. The Pro 100 could not separate him from the shadows. The Pro 1000 did an amazing job on this image. Last but not least is a black and white test image from Northlight Images. This is a common one you'll find on the web. And I like it because there's some fine detail. When you zoom in, some of the, some of the aspects of this image have small lines and small details in them. And you can really see what a printer is capable of. And hands down, the Pro 1000 took this image home and just ran away with it. So that's kind of some of the things that I was doing with printing my test images. And again, I printed an awful lot of test images to come up with the conclusions that I came up with, which is that I liked the printer. Now, there's a couple of things I liked about this printer that were not related to the actual prints, but I think they're actually important to point out. <clears throat> if you're buying a $1,200 printer, you might be buying it for a team of people in a marketing department or in a graphic design department or in a photo lab or something like that. And when you're doing it from a business point of view, you have to worry about the cost. And for most inkjet printers that people buy, they have this impression in their head, which we will actually get into in detail shortly, that it's extremely expensive, and it can be, but it's not necessarily what you think. And so Canon makes available for the Pro 1000, not the Pro 100, the accounting manager. It is awesome for understanding your costs and for cost control. I will say one thing. They really need better documentation on this thing. I'm techie. I mean, I'm by no means a noob when it comes to tech. And figuring out the accounting manager took me a while to get it to actually do what it was supposed to do and show me some numbers. Awesome tool. Wish I hadn't had to figure it out by Googling and doing it on my own. The media configuration tool is another admin tool that lets you download from your computer, or I, in some ways you could say upload from your computer to the printer, more specific details on the type of media that you are going to print to, how much ink it needs, how it retains color, how far it needs to be away from the print head, things like that. You can customize the settings that are in the printer and you can upload your own media to the printer in the form of AM1X files. Now, AM1X files do not exist for every kind of paper. Red River Paper makes a lot of AM1X files, but they don't make them for every paper that they make. And I gotta say, I really wish that they did, and I wish every manufacturer would. And here's why. When you're printing on a photo printer like this, you're choosing some abstract paper. Let's say it's you know company A, and the paper is their Berita paper. 
when you go into your print dialog box in printing photos, you have to choose a paper type. Well, it doesn't say Berita in there. It has things like photo semi-gloss or photo luster N or something to that effect or photo gloss paper. You have to map the type of paper you're printing on to one of the pre-existing paper types so the printer knows how to treat that particular paper. Usually what you do is you download a PDF from the manufacturer or you look on their website and it will tell you, sometimes even they ship a piece of paper in the box with the paper, for this paper, choose this paper type. The problem is you have to remember it or every time you change to that paper, you've got to remember to set the right paper type. What an AM1X file does is it embeds that actual paper name in your print driver and in the printer. So when you go to print on a Red River paper paper, you might actually be able to choose Red River paper Berita in the actual paper type. And to me, that radically increased my satisfaction with doing my own printing at home. It was a much better user experience. One problem I encountered was it supposed to show up in the print driver by paper name and on the LCD of the printer itself by paper name. I got it to show up on the printer one time, never been able to get it to show up again. I have no idea why. I've got a question into Canon. If they answer me back in a reasonable time, I'll add their answer to the show notes. Other than that, just suffice it to say, it's in the print driver, it's easy to access, works really well. The other thing was with the Pro 100, there's a setting called for all printers really, there's a setting called prevent paper abrasion. Here's what that is. I print to very thick paper. If the paper's too thick, as it goes through and accumulates ink, it may rub the print head, messing up the paper, messing up the print, in theory, possibly damaging the print head, although I've never heard of that happening. Well, with the Pro 100, you had to go into some advanced properties of the printer to be able to set the prevent paper abrasion. It's much easier on the Pro 1000. It's right there in the normal print dialog box, easy to get to. Another thing I loved about the printer from an admin point of view is as a network person myself, anytime I install a printer, including this one, the day I installed it, first thing I did was I pulled up a web browser and I typed in the IP address of the printer to see what admin features are available in the embedded web server. With the Pro 100, those features were greatly limited. You can't even see your print ink status in the web interface, which to me was crazy. This one, you can see that and a lot more. I like the admin features from the web interface. This one worked moment one and never failed. My Pro 100, I had a lot of paper feed issues. I'd put paper in, it would take it. Put another piece of paper in, the wheels would spin and it would never grab the paper and then the paper feed light would start blinking. With this one, it's much more rock solid. It's much more reliable in my opinion never failed. It prints 16-bit, as did the Pro 100. But here's another feature of this one from a printing point of view that I absolutely loved. It has an actual black and white print mode. In the black and white print mode, this only uses monochrome inks to give you a true black and white print. And when paired with the right paper, which by the way, the Berita paper for black and white, absolutely awesome, right? If it's paired with the right paper and you do the true black and white mode, <clears throat> you get some amazing prints out of this printer. So let's dive into cost a little bit. I mentioned the accounting manager before, and with the accounting manager, what you do is you tell the accounting manager, I have this particular paper in a box of 25. It cost me this amount of money, and it will calculate your per sheet cost. You tell it, I bought these inks and this chromium optimizer, and they each cost me this amount of money, and it will then calculate your ink usage. You see, every time you do a print on this printer, it keeps a log of how much ink it uses based on what paper you were printing on. That log is what the accounting manager uses. When you run a report with the accounting manager, it goes and it gets the log. It matches the paper type and the job with the type of papers whose cost you have entered into the accounting manager. And it tells you, you use this amount of ink, you use this amount of paper, and here's the cost. And it's enlightening. I mean, seriously, again, one of those aha moments. So I wanna give you some examples. And while I do this, if you're watching the video version, like I did with the photos before that I printed, 
on the video version, you'll see these on screen. If you're listening to the audio version, for these numbers I'm about to quote to you, I'll put them in the show notes at behindtheshot.tv. And same with the images that I showed earlier that, that I used for test prints, you can see those images up on the website as well. So let's talk about this for, for a minute. When you go to a lab like MPix, which is my lab of choice, it's the consumer side of Miller's, right? And MPix does an amazing job. They've got great paper. They have great prints. When you compare a lab like MPix to printing here using the cost that you get out of accounting manager, it was somewhat shocking. So first of all, MPix. There's two ways to print photos at MPix. Way number one is their standard photo print. Way number two is the uh, the inkjet version that they do called Gicle or Zicle. And the the Gicle can only be printed on either their gloss or their fine art paper. It's a different cost for each one. And the, the Zicle prints, I'm changing the way I'm pronouncing it. I'm using phonetics. It's Zicle is the way they write it phonetically, but it's French. It means to spray. And I think it's Gicle, but, you know, Correct me in the show notes, that's fine. Uh, but anyway, there's two different options, gloss paper, fine art paper for the Gicle. For the, the normal photo print, it's their default paper is what I'm basing it on, but you could also choose a metallic paper and there's other options you can choose like a fine linen texture or a luster coating or something like that. So I'll give you a base price for those. So let's, let's start. First of all, an eight by 10 print, an eight by 10. The Gicle print on gloss is $3.73, fine art $5.09. The normal photo printed MPix, $2.79. My cost for an 8x10 using my high-end paper in this printer, $1.50 to $1.80. And I don't have to pay shipping. You see, with a, a lab, you have to pay usually either an economy or some other expedited shipping. With MPix, the economy is $3.95 and standard two-day shipping is $7.95. There's other options that are more. You have to add those to the cost. So if you're only printing one print, it can be 10 bucks, whereas for me, it's less than two. Let's move to an eight and a half by 11. An eight and a half by 11 print with the Gicle, you can't actually get eight and a half by 11. They have an eight by 12. And their eight by 12 on gloss is 598, fine art 761. MPix photo print starts at 366. My cost for an eight and a half by 11, $1.50 to $1.80. Let's go to a 9 by 13, which is not available at MPix. Uh, MPix offers a 10 by 13 in the Gicle, and it's $9.36 for the gloss, $11.56 for the fine art paper. The normal MPix photo print is $4.82 for a 9 by 12. It starts there and goes up. My cost on a 9 by 13, you ready for this? $1.95 to $2, depending on the print, because some prints take more ink, et cetera. You're starting to see a trend here, right? One last one, I wanna go through the big one. 13 by 19, otherwise known as A3 plus. You can't get an exact 13 by 19 at MPix. They have a 12 by 18. Close enough for numbers, let's go. First of all, in the gloss on the Gicle, you've got 2249. The fine art paper is 2614. Think about that number, right? A normal MPix photo print is 1332. You ready for what a 13 by 19 A3 print costs me? And I printed this on uh, the Red River paper 13 by 19 and my Ilford 13 by 19, okay? With all that into account, $3.90 to $4.30. Think about those cost differences. Think about not paying for shipping. And very quickly you see, you could recover the cost of this printer very, very quickly. So again, there were a few holy crap moments on this. Detail in my photos I had never seen printed, only seen on screen. Be aware the image matters, right? I could see somebody printing a photo that would be best on semi-gloss, but they print it on matte, they don't like it, and they blame the printer. I could see somebody printing an image that has a manageable dynamic range and a manageable gamut on both a Pro 100 and a Pro 1000 and not seeing a huge difference between the two. It is possible. But if you have an image with a wide enough gamut and if you have an image with a wide enough dynamic range, the Pro 1000, it wins hands down every single time. And here's another advantage of printing on your own, regardless of what printer you choose, right? You choose the paper. Again, with the MPix higher end inkjet printing, you had a choice of gloss or fine art. 
on your own, you have a choice of Red River paper, Hammamule paper, Ilford paper, Moab paper, and a myriad of other options with each manufacturer having a wide selection of both weights and finishes and types of paper. The list goes on and on. You can literally choose any paper, any time. That's a huge win. No question about it. Now, I did have some issues. One of them isn't so much me, but I've seen it online a lot. A lot of people want to print from a roll of paper. This printer has no adapter for a roll. That doesn't bother me. I'm going to use sheets and sheets only. There's two things that I really think should have been documented better up front. What does the Chroma Optimizer do? If you don't know, watch my image, my interview with Jim Booth from Canon earlier in the show because we discussed that. But I wish it had been written down for me to understand so I didn't have to Google it and understand how to use it better because there are some options you can set. For the Chroma Optimizer. The other thing was, as soon as I set this up, I mentioned this to you. I jumped into the web interface of the printer to see what was there. And one of the things you can see on the Pro 1000 is your ink status. And it instantly showed me at 50%, but I hadn't printed anything. So I Googled it to death and I found the answer, but I, I had a more detailed conversation with Jim from Canon, again, in the interview earlier in the show, to better understand why that is. Normally, when you look at an inkjet printer, I shouldn't say normally, but often, you'll see the ink tanks at the top of the printer. Well, there's so many ink tanks here, and at 80 milliliters, they're pretty big, right? If they put them on the top, the printer would be very tall. So they put them all on the bottom of the printer. The problem with that is it has a longer throw to get from the ink cartridge all the way up to the print head instead of being right next to the print head. So there's a series of tubes. As soon as you put the ink in and turn this thing on, it starts actually priming those tubes and it takes 50% of your ink to prime the tubes. You're not losing it, it's in the tubes. It's gonna print, right? But there's this mental thing when you see the dialog box tell you that you're at 50% before you've printed anything. That actually bothered me and I just wish that it had been clearly labeled. So my bottom line on the Canon Image ProGraph Pro 1000, it is an awesome printer. If you are a wedding photographer and just need to turn around a quick teaser for a bride and groom after an engagement shoot, perfect for you. If you just want to print your own prints, either for sale or display at a local gallery or your own walls, and you want lasting archive capable prints where you can choose a good acid free paper, this printer is definitely for you and highly recommended. It's not cheap, but I think it pays for itself over time, no question. In fact, the savings, again, can be, can be pretty huge on it. I've had situations where my shipping from a lab cost me more than the one print I needed right now. For those type of scenarios, it's a great printer. And there's a website called lightstocking.com, and they did a post on the best photo printer of 2019, they chose this one as well. So if you're looking for a higher end printer, Canon Image ProGraph Pro 1000, again, highly recommended. I'm Steve Brazel, the host of Behind the Shot. And on this show, usually, we try and get inside the mind of great photographers by taking a closer look behind one of their shots from conception to completion, all the stories and challenges that happen in between. Think of it as interviewing a photograph to better understand the choices that any individual photographer may have made in making that particular image. And we will get back to that, but periodically, I like to just bring you something different like an image review. And I've got a couple other special types of episodes that I'm looking at doing, and I've got news on that hopefully coming for you soon. So as always, Thanks for listening. You can subscribe to this show both in audio and video in your favorite podcast app, and you can subscribe to the video version on YouTube. If you subscribe on YouTube, make sure that you click the bell so you are notified each and every time I release a new episode. Thanks again. Reach out to me on social media. I appreciate your watching the show, and we'll talk to you next time.